it was a real pleasure to be asked to come here tonight. Um, and then when I realised that there were ads going out on RT1 and everybody I knew was texting me, uh, I nearly died. So, <laughs> and I don't mind speaking in front of groups, so it's not that I'm socially anxious or I mind the, the speaking. I do find the public advertisement a little challenging, as it turns out. So I learned something new about myself in this process. Um, and that's why I suppose we're here this evening, it's to see if I can help in any way for you to learn something new about yourself or about how you might engage with this journey, as Jan calls it, and equally I don't like the, the word, um, of living with an illness, living with CLL. Um, because I think when we're challenged by something as, as big as a diagnosis like that, um, but equally there are other challenges in life that are, that are huge that come our way, we find out something about the person we are or the person that we always thought we were that maybe feels a little bit different. Um, and having a space to, to stop and go, how has this challenged? How has it changed? Um, how have I grown? How have I felt I've withdrawn or shrunk? Um, and how can I be the best me within this is, is probably a, a really good thing for us all to do. Um, one of the things that, that Jan mentioned when I sort of had a phone call with her and I said, why this to be useful? What would be useful? And she said, but you know, really trying maybe to keep it specific, not too generic. So I had this image in my head about uh, how to live. So John said, make it specific. And I thought of this manual. I thought of, like, would it be great if you had a manual that taught you how to live? And then how to live with the diagnosis. It be brilliant. Um, and even better, if it wasn't that generic, if it was more like this kind of bullseye version that said, how do I Louise, live with my problem in this moment. Um, and then I remembered I'm a psychologist. And if you think it's hard to get a straight out answer out of a medic, try getting one out of a psychologist. Because basically what we say most of the time when we're asked a question is, it depends. And it is so annoying. Um, but the reason we say that is because we are all unicorns. <laughs> um, we are all unicorns in that the individual human experience is so variable. Yes, we share bodies that have a rough template. Yes, we, you know, we, we share aspects of humanity that each of us carry, but really, we're a very unique story. And we come with our own characteristics. We come with our own personality. We come with our own way of coping, our own set of values and beliefs that we've grown up with and that we learned for ourselves. And we come with a way of looking at the world and looking at ourselves in it. So we're not just trying to be evasive when people ask for a specific question and we say it depends. It really, the story matters. The story matters so very much. So what I'm going to try and do over the next hour is to balance a little bit that challenge of what, what do we know in general helps us psychologically to cope with something as significant as a serious illness. And then, how can you guys think a little bit about what those general, uh, general advice or suggestions, how they might apply to you? So kind of trying them on for size and go, hang on, no, that's not me, but maybe this other one will work. So the things I, I might talk about, the suggestions I might have tonight, they're not a prescription. They are not going to work for everybody. Probably any more than the medications we have work for everybody. It is a case of trying it on. And, seeing what works for you. Um, but always good to have some options. So that's what we're about this evening. We're just about identifying some options. You guys know better than I ever will know, maybe, hopefully, who knows, um, what CLL does when it comes into your life in terms of how it threatens well-being. Um, what I've been told over the years um, is, is that moment of, of life-alteringness that happens when we get a serious diagnosis. Most of us, those of us who haven't had serious illness in our lives, tend to travel through the world with a bit of a sense of ourselves as being kind of immortal. You know, we know that we're going to die, but we don't think about it every day. In fact, most of us don't think about it at all until something serious happens. And that sense of ourselves as being essentially immortal, essentially in control, is a really helpful psychological me defense mechanism we call it. Because it stops us thinking or worrying about the big picture stuff we can't change and helps narrow down the range of control that we have. So generally speaking, we go through the world thinking we're invulnerable. 
thinking we're immortal. We know we're not, but this is how we live. Essentially in control. Um, and we have a sense of who we are and what we're about. Um, and what I've learned after 10 years of working in psycho-oncology is that illness is kind of like taking a, a razor to all of that. It generally gets rid of all of that. And it brings, brings mortality out of this abstract concept into a lived sense of mortality that is so very different. I don't think it can be can be described in words. I think it can only be felt. And CLL in particular has some unique challenges that don't come with every cancer diagnosis. And again, you guys know this better than anybody. It has such an unpredictable course. That period of watchful waiting doesn't apply to every group of patients who live with a serious illness or cancer. It is often the case with, with your group. Treatments are aggressive very often. You spoke, John, about the side effects of your treatment, and some of those side effects will be immediate, and some of them will be late effects that don't even begin until years after the treatment. Societal understanding, as, as I've seen so much in, in the, the last year with the Make Blood Cancer Visible campaign, society, blood cancers are much less well understood from society, and a diagnosis of breast cancer is incredibly challenging and has a huge burden for the person psychologically. But there is a community understanding of it that I think can make things a lot easier. Um, and, and this idea of survivorship, right? you know, the, the literature tells us we're a survivor from the time we get a diagnosis, we keep going. But it's, yeah, it comes with a burden, this idea that we go through all this and we're a survivor. And I suppose I want to talk a little bit just about the, the challenges of watchful waiting. And it really fits with what Jan said. That idea that you walk into an office, you have a conversation, and all of a sudden you become somebody who has a cancer diagnosis. You become somebody who has a serious illness. And yet for many of the patients I've met over the years who have a diagnosis of CLL, at the same time, they may feel quite well, and they may not be on any treatment. And that juxtaposition psychologically is just head melting. <coughs> we, does that kind of fit with you guys? You know the way we like to make sense of the world. A leads to B, one and one is two. We like our lived experience to be coherent. We like our lived experience to have some kind of rationality to it. And this just doesn't add up. So we end up, very often, having a whole series of thoughts, um, often associated with what the medical profession or other people tell us, that we should just be able to get on with things, because you're all right now. Um, that you should be able to put it to one side because it, at the moment you're well or you're well enough. And it's that idea that I feel I've really heard over the years, everything's the same but everything's different. I'm not going for big invasive treatments right now. I don't technically have an illness that's changing my functioning a huge amount, but my whole world has changed. And that's a particularly big challenge psychologically. When our world looks different and we're told it's different, at least what we see and what we live match up. But when we're told something's different but it looks the same, that's a lot to get your head around and can really be, be a challenge for people. So when people are in a watchful waiting phase, and you, you know this all too well, you're told to go live your life, right? Is that kind of what, what people are told? Carry on as normal. Do play golf, do work, do whatever you're going to do. Um, and I suppose all too often what people tell me is that this is what it feels like. So that their life is somewhere in the background, but that this diagnosis is taking up everything they can see, that everything is viewed through that lens. And I suppose I would be proviso this with this is not everyone's experience. For some people, the CLL is actually three tiny letters in the corner of their life that they take out of a box once every six months when they go for an appointment. Um, so I suppose the challenge in presenting psychological information is that it will never apply to everybody. But this is an experience that a lot of people report. That it, it is this massive thing in their lives, and yet they're told, just go live. Um, and it can affect even the most beautiful moments in our day. So I was thinking this, that, this morning, um, you know, today was such it was an autumn day, it was crisp, it was blue skies. It's the kind of day where you go to the forest, you have a walk, and you think, ah, it's good to be alive. Um, and when you're living with a serious illness, even those moments can get 
viewed through the lens of illness, or, or it can have a place, it's like the thing you pull along beside you that you don't want to be carrying. Um, and what it can do, if that is the case, if for you, having this diagnosis, being in this watchful waiting period, feels like everything gets tarnished by something that is supposedly on hold, but feels very real, then what can end up happening is that we have a lot of thoughts about how we should be coping that I could do better, I should do better, and that I must do better. Um, and I think that gets fed into a lot by, by our society, um, by our medical culture, maybe even by our psychological culture. Um, there's a lot of information about positivity, and we'll talk about this later on, and about focusing on, on the now, as if focusing on the now doesn't also mean focusing on the difficult parts of the now. Um, it's not some Pollyanna version. And the reality is that if your experience is this, that CLL is this big part of your life, even when you're trying to engage in, in the more enjoyable moments, that that's really not your fault. We have these brains that are designed to focus on threat. So if everyone just kind of makes a little fist of their hand, and just bear with me, I know it's silly, but if I'm going to do it, everyone should do it. Um, and you can see, kind of if you look at your fist like that, you've got your spinal cord and your hands more or less your brain. And if you unfurl your fingers in where your thumb is curled, that's the oldest part of the brain. You've got the limbic system and you've got the old reptilian brain in there. And the rest of the bit, the bit that's your, the, the fist, that's the newer part of your brain, the neocortex. The red and blue, the old parts of the brain, <coughs> they're pretty much the same for us as they are for reptiles and other animals. They haven't advanced that much. They're, the, the new part of the brain, the neocortex, that is it. You, humans are unique in terms of the evolution and development of the neocortex, but the old part, yeah, still, they stuck with the old model. They didn't really upgrade the hardware or the software or any of that. They kind of kept it as it was. Um, what that means is that the part of our brain that controls fear, that controls anxiety, controls those really basic emotions, lives in that old part. Um, and if you think about it, if something bad's going to happen and you're relying on your brain for survival, you want that old part to be pretty quick to turn on, right? Um, you want that, that part of your brain that says, uh, uh, something's about to happen, you got to get yourself safe. You wouldn't want it to sit around weighing up the options for three or four hours. You want it to kind of go, oh Jesus, get out of here, move, move fast. And it does that. That old part of the brain, the, the amygdala that controls fear, that is really efficient at turning on. And it turns on before any of us consciously <coughs> consider whether or not to turn it on. So no one decides to feel afraid. Your brain does that for you. The limbic system, the amygdala goes, is there a threat? And it instantly evaluates yes or no. And it's pre-conscious. So the conscious brain, the thinking that we're aware of happens up here. This part in here, that's pre-conscious. No one, no one knows that's going on. It just happens. And it's a really efficient system. But it was designed way back in the day when we were more like these guys than this. We were sitting around in hotel rooms thinking about our lives and, and how we might live them to our best effect. And it was designed to turn on immediately. So, you know, Mr. Deborah here is having his chill out and he's eating the grass and life is good and the sun is shining. Um, within seconds, milliseconds of the lion appearing, that system turns on. The amygdala goes, there's a threat, you need to be afraid, you need to do something. And it's so efficient and it's so good for physical safety, for getting you out of a situation where you might be killed. And immediately, there's, you know, there's run. Um, and he runs and he runs. And this guy, in this case, was lucky. He got away. And <laughs> nobody was expecting that. <laughs> this is I've done the research. This was definitely time. <laughs> human. If you, and, and you know, you, you, 
don't need to be a psychologist to know this. You look at our, our colleagues who work in, in evolutionary biology and, and work in the, in the animal kingdom. Animals after a threat have gone out of their environment. They don't show any PTSD. Very, very quickly, they go back to doing what they did before. They go back to grazing, they go back to mating, they go back to surviving the conditions of the wild. But they don't show evidence of stored biological stress. They just don't do it. They, they all do this shaking off thing, they seem to have a movement of shaking, and then they go back to eating. And there's loads of evidence around this. You can have conditioned fear for animals, and anyone who's seen a dog that's been beaten that can, can tell this, but in the wild, for an immediate environmental threat, they engage their defense mechanism and they, they unleash They unleash afterwards and they go back to eating. What they don't do, because they don't have a frontal cortex, they don't have the part of the brain that's very developed in us, is they don't hang out later going, Jesus, I'm getting older. That guy is going to get older. <laughs> Seriously though, because that's what we would do, right? You, you survive something and you think, well, I'm not going to survive this the next time because I'm getting older and this is not going to go so well in 10 years' time. <laughs> they don't seem to, as far as we can tell, no one's ever had chats, but from what we can see from their behaviour, they don't show any evidence that they worry about their loved ones if they die. You know, it's an immediate fight-flight reaction that happens in the context of a, a physical trigger. They don't seem to sit around wondering about their plans for the future. I, there's so much that I want to do. They don't seem to have a sense of persecution. Why me? Why is the lion chasing me and not the other guy? They just seem to go with this. And I know this is kind of humorous, but, but the point is really serious. We have this brain that has developed a frontal cortex, this part here, that is so much more advanced than any other creature that we know of. And what it does is it gives us an awareness that we're mortal. And it gives us the capacity to create and to plan and to imagine. But once you can start imagining, you can imagine bad stuff. You can imagine the things that can go wrong. You can imagine the things that might happen. If you don't have a very developed frontal cortex, you don't have that capacity to be a sentient being. You don't have that capacity to imagine the stuff that can go wrong. So the, the, the different wiring makes a difference. Oh yeah, I also have not giving out to himself for worrying. So why am I worrying about this? I shouldn't be so stressed. Because anyone who's really good at worrying is also very good at telling themselves that they shouldn't. Um, which is something I know all too well. So, so this, this, is, you know, this is a humorous slide, but it's our evolutionary heritage. We, have, we share the same neurobiology in terms of our central nervous system only with an advanced neocortex, as many other animals. That, that old brain, that red blue really is the same as for most of the animal kingdom. And it is so primitive. So for anyone who's ever given in to themselves for feeling afraid or for worrying, the biggest take home message is, it's not your fault. This is your biology. This is how we are wired. Um, and I did a, a, a training, I did a lot of self-compassion training I think it's a really helpful way of managing ourselves as humans and managing illness. But one of the, you turn up to a self-compassion training and you think it's all going to be nice. And then I arrived and kind of one of the first things the trainer said was, being human is not easy, it's really hard. And he does a lot of work on the neurochemistry and the neurobiology of the brain. And he's like, the brain was designed for survival. It was not designed for happiness. Which is a really... You know, we're so attached to happiness, understandably, and we're so attached to contentment and ease. But actually, if we look at the biology, or we look at the biology of our brain, it was designed for survival, it wasn't designed for happiness. If it was designed for happiness, the amygdala probably wouldn't fire automatically anymore. It would send a message to your neocortex going, is this a real threat or just a make-believe, you know? But it doesn't do that. It, do, it, it, it evaluates all threat the same. And the really annoying thing about the amygdala is it doesn't know the difference between a threat that you've thought up in your head and one that's in the environment. So, you know, when I'm sitting in the car and I'm thinking, Christ, you know, what if I mess up that I'm awful and people heard on the radio, it's going to be awful. 
my amygdala fires straight away. That hasn't happened. No one said I was awful, but my amygdala treats the information the exact same as if there was an accident about to happen on the road I'm driving. It doesn't treat the information differently. So this beautiful brain that can imagine and can dream and can create all kinds of things has really left us in a very difficult set of circumstances because it's giving our amygdala, our fear center, information about bad news, about possible threats, all of the time, and we're trying to deal with it. And in life, when things are going well, it's normally manageable. But when we get an illness that comes with so many ifs, buts, maybes, and unanswered questions, it can become really unmanageable. Um, I've seen some nodding, so does this fit with anybody? Anyone? Yeah, um, it fits with me at least. Um, so what can happen when we get an illness is we end up like this. And this is the, the average human experience. So we have on average 70,000 thoughts a day. 70,000. Like we're, we're demented with thoughts. We have so many of them. And then about 50 thoughts a minute. And that's just a huge amount of brain activity. Most of our thoughts, we don't even register. They're happening kind of below the radar. But they shape how we feel. They shape what we do. And I suppose if we don't learn to, to find a way of managing all that material, if it gets very negative, things can get pretty dark pretty quickly. Things that I'm, I'm, I, I think for most of us as humans, we, we can remember a time or we know a time where the thinking was really challenging. And it's really, really easy because there's just so many of them, 70,000 a day. Your thoughts become problematic, it can feel burdensome, it can get overwhelming very, very quickly. And again, not our fault, just the brain we were given, but it's why when we get something like a serious illness or something like CLL, where we're going to have to find a way of managing thoughts, because there's so many understandable questions about what will happen, that it becomes really important to look at what our relationship with thoughts is. We can't change the fact that we have a brain that does this, but what we can do is look at how we, what our relationship to it is. Um, and that's what we're going to look at. So I don't know about you, but... Um, oh, where's the there it is. Does anyone remember being like this? <laughs> Does anyone have ac access or know of small children who you can look at and go, wow, that is how they experience the world. Kind of they experience it through their senses, right? They see, they hear, they feel, it's all about immediate experience. They are so in the moment. And I guess as, our, as that brain of ours, that, that neocortex, the frontal lobe, this part of the brain, isn't fully developed until we're 25. So as that develops, we get more and more thinky. And for most of us, for many of us, the picture changes from that to something like this, you know? Um, and what we want to do is we want to go back to that. And how do we do that? Um, an interesting kind of study that I think is really interesting. Um, so when we're in this mode, this, this kind of heavy thinking, burdened mode, we're really effective at certain things, okay? We're really good at planning. Often we're very good at getting stuff done. We're task oriented. Um, what we're not very good at is being in the moment, because thinking generally brings us out of right now. So oftentimes when we're very caught up in thinking. We don't really know. Do you ever have a dinner and you kind of don't remember actually what it tasted like? Or you drove a journey that you've driven lots of times and you've no idea how it went or whether or not you turned off. So when we're in, in automatic mode where our thinking kind of dominates, we lose touch with, with our day-to-day -day lived experience. What's actually happening right now? And I suppose when we talk about illness, that's a really important distinction because for a lot of people living with an illness like CLL, there are periods, moments, maybe only flashes, when there might be a felt sense of actually right now my body is okay, or that pain is a little bit less than it was, or I'm a little bit less tired than I have been, or this is the week without an infection. But if we're very, very, very caught up in our thinking about illness, we don't actually get to live those good moments because we're so preoccupied and caught up with the bad ones that happened and the ones with where we will come, we really miss out on the present moment. And I like this 
slide just because it, it reminds me of a study. So they did a study in Cornell University in the States many, many years ago. And the study was involved a, a person, an expert, a, a researcher, asking for directions. So just walking into campus and asking Joe Soap for directions. And halfway through getting the set of directions, two guys holding a door would walk between them. Um, and as that happened, the person asking for directions would switch. And on each occasion, the, the switch was, was a clear one. You know, they didn't kind of replace me with my doppelganger. They replaced the person asking for directions with somebody who was taller, who was wearing different clothes and who had a different accent. And they did it twice because they couldn't believe the results the first time. Um, and once they found that 47% of people didn't notice the switch, that's one in two. And they thought, that can't be right. So they did it again. 33% of people only noticed the switch the second time. That's nearly 70% of people who didn't even notice who they were talking to. And I suppose it's just a really small but nice example of how this busy, busy mind takes us away from the present moment. Um, and when we're living with illness, often our mind is very busy trying to handle uncomfortable emotions, uncomfortable feelings, difficult thoughts about the future, difficult sensations physically when we're living with treatment effects and, and illness effects. A lot of our thinking can go into trying to get away from sleep, trying to make difference, trying to avoid. Um, and Carl Jung said very many years ago, what you resist persists. And when he said this, we didn't have any of the fancy brain scanners and we didn't have any of the science to really test to you know what he was on about. And he's a pretty smart guy, Carl Jung, but we didn't have any way of proving that it was true. But now we know, because you put people in a scanner, you know, you tell them not to do something and the very part of their brain that's supposed to be deactivated is going like crazy. You tell children not to behave a particular way and then we know from behavior experiences, experiments, more often they're inclined to do it more. I ask you all not to think of the elephant, and that's the only thing you think of. So we know this happens. Um, and I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm just thinking of in work this week, you know, what I do is, is work with people to try and find a way of living with the really difficult aspects of a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I totally get why what you'd want to do is push that away. Um, and there are times and moments when that is the most appropriate thing to do, to distract, to avoid, to not think about. That is such a helpful solution some of the time. But it's just not one that works all of the time. So we need other ways of managing it when it does come in. Um, and getting in a battle with our thoughts, getting in a battle with ourselves because we shouldn't feel afraid or we shouldn't be X or we should be Y, really, really compounds an already difficult situation. Um, and increases our suffering. Um, so we really, really try to work on this, what we resist persists. And what we move towards is this idea of can I allow? You hear a lot in the literature maybe about acceptance. You hear a bit about acceptance, it's right to accept things. Um, and acceptance, as someone who's been on extended sick leave myself not that path long ago, Acceptance can feel like a bridge too far. It certainly did for me at the time. Because acceptance kind of feels like you're kind of buddying up to something you really hate, you know? Um, but for me, the idea of allowing was really helpful. I don't have to like this. I do not have to want it. But it is happening. So can I allow? Can I acknowledge that it is here? The, the best analogy I have for this idea of allowing is if we look internationally at kind of peace processes that have happened over the years, and think of our own Northern Ireland. If you look at how these peace processes tend to happen over time, what normally happens is no one will sit in the room and talk to anybody. And then everybody, and what you might want to do is you might want to say, well, you're being really badly behaved at the moment, so you don't get to come into these meetings. You've got to behave and then you can come in. But actually what we know works. And the only thing that's ever worked is when everyone sits at the table. Even the ones who aren't behaving, even the ones who nobody wants to talk to. It's only by engaging with people that any peace has ever been really achieved in the world when we look at areas of conflict. And I think it's a bit like that within ourselves. The parts of our lives that we really don't like, it's only by actually engaging with them, by saying, look, you're here, 
can't get rid of you. I'm going to have to find some way of dealing with you. We've, we've got to sit down. We've got to be like the United Nations. We've got to give everyone a voice. We've got to say, okay, this is something I have to deal with. But that process can take a long time, and I think just giving ourselves the time for that to happen. So if we're not going to resist, what are we going to do? Um, and the other side of that is learning to become uncomfortable with our own discomfort, our own psychological, it being ill at ease psychologically. That same guy, um, Paul Gilbert, who does the self-compassion training, remember I said he opened up by saying, we're not really wired for happiness. He then said, which I thought was equally cheery, our lives are limited. We are destined to get older and die. We often suffer illnesses and tragedies. Our lives are influenced by the lottery of our genetic makeup and chance events. No one chose to be born in the house they did, with the body they did, in the period of time they were born. Our life is full of change and loss. That's the start of a very chirpy three days. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's true. It's true. This is life. And, and it's not what we want. You know, we'd, we'd like to be maybe have a slightly different body or, you know, the, the sleeker hair or the, the better job. But this is the life we have. Better parents, be born into a slightly more affluent social economic status. Who knows? We didn't make choices about so much of constitutes the life that we live. But this is the only one we have. Um, and that's not about pushing responsibility back on us in a punitive way, but it is about saying, well, how can I live the only life I have in the best way that, that I can for me and for the people that I care about? And the evidence is, if you look at the research, that when we accept that we will suffer, and that we accept that difficult things will happen, it becomes somewhat easier to live with them. Um, but yeah, life, life is not a bed of roses, as it turns out. Um, so here's the more practical pieces. What helps? I'm going to go through the next four over the next checking the time here, so we have a half an hour. So we're going to spend the next half hour looking at these next four categories and doing a bit of a stop and think about how does that fit with me, all right? Um, the first one there, knowing your style. You can't figure out what you need to do to help yourself if you don't first know a little bit about what you're bringing to the equation. Um, so given a bit of time to think about how do I cope with this illness? What kind of approach do I tend to put into play? And how is that working for me? And how does that fit with the way I used to cope with things or that I cope with other things in my life? It can be a really helpful sort of window onto ourselves and a guide as to what might be the other things that I could add in. Um, knowing what matters to us. Um, I suppose if, we, if we're not clear about what, what's important to us, what our values are, then how can we know if we're really living a life that fits with them? Um, and a meaningful life is one that enhances our values, that brings forth the things that we think are important in life, in small and big ways. Um, we're going to look at this idea of resilience and what that is and how you build it. And then something I'm really big on, which is, you know that brain that we all did a little while ago? Our central nervous system, the amygdala, part of the brain that deals with fear, it triggers a whole host of responses within the nervous system. Physiological responses that happen every time that amygdala gets triggered, and we've talked about how easily that happens. But equally, there are things that we know soothe the nervous system. There are things that we know act like a band to the nervous system. So they can, all too often in, in, in our society today, we're all a bit stressed out, we're all a bit fraught, we're all a bit on edge. Um, and there's a whole host of practices that we know, the evidence is there, highly rigorous at this stage, soothe the nervous system. So why wouldn't we do some of those things um, if we know they help? So looking at our coping style, we all kind, kind of know what a coping style is, right? A coping style is, what do I think and how do, what do I do to manage when adversity comes into my life? We don't need to cope when everything is fine. We need to cope when there's challenges. And our coping, whether or not we're coping, is basically 
the balance between what's our suffering and what do we think our personal resources are to manage it. And our personal resources are wider than just ourselves. It's our support systems, it's our medical team, but it's, it's me and the people who support me. How well equipped do I feel that we are to manage this challenge? Um, can anyone think of somebody they know who they would describe as a good coper? Someone who's a genius, they cope great with stuff. Or they cope great with anything or something that happened. One. There's not a good coper in sight. Right. <laughs> I know an extra coper. Okay. 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 okay, yeah. Listen, if you've gotten this far in life, you're alright. You're doing okay. You're coping okay. I was thinking about this when I wrote it, and I was thinking, who are the people in my life that if someone said, you know, if, if there was a challenge going to come, who would you want on your team? Because they're, they're, they're sturdy, they're resilient, they're good copers. Can anyone think of somebody like that? Yeah. Okay, okay, we have a few more. We're beginning to worry about the general state of the country. <laughs> so, so there are people in life who we know seem, we think, they cope well. Can you think to yourself now, what is it about that person and about how, specifically about how they, they go about managing challenges that makes them, to your mind, good at coping? Is there something in particular they do or don't do? Any suggestions about what, what that person you were thinking of might do or not do that you think makes them good at coping? How do you think about it? Okay. Logically. <laughs> so they're not reactive, they think things through. Yeah. Don't get emotional. Ah, yeah. Okay, so they park their feelings for a bit and they deal with the crisis and then they go to the feelings later. And they can compartmentalize. They're not just focusing and obsessing, but it's one issue. Yeah. And to be able to say, okay, I'm on, won't put everything in on top yeah. They can zoom out, see the big picture, and go, not this right now, maybe this. There are so many traits that you might identify as being a good coper, but there are some that our society particularly values. Um, how I think about coping is a bit of like that old expression, it's more than one way to skin a cat, but any way you do it, it's messy. <laughs> um, there is no perfect way to cope. There just isn't. Um, and there's absolutely no one way to cope that's good in every situation. So if I cope by parking all of my feelings, well then if I'm having a conversation with a loved one who, who wants me to be emotionally available to them in the middle of a crisis, I'm maybe not the best person for that. I can solve the physical problems that are happening, but I might not be very good at connecting with them emotionally and being there for them emotionally. So while that person literally has great coping skills in certain areas, that might be their challenge. Um, likewise, if I'm very good at connecting with them, you know the, the people who when we've had a loss or when we've had a challenge can sit with our pain and can hear it? But maybe they're not the person to go to when we need mobilizing, when we need a bit of a kick up that and moving forward. So there's just no perfect way to do it. But what is really important if you're facing illness is to have a sense of what your own style is when you're facing this illness. And not because it's right or it's wrong, but because it then tells you are there other things that might have meant that that would be helpful? Um, so, our coping style, I mean, this debate in the literature about the right way to word this, but, but more or less, the, the approach that you typically take, take across a variety of life situations. So, if you look at back on your life and you think, okay, when there's a crisis, when something difficult happens, what do I tend to do? Am I a procrastinating avoider. If I've got a big thing coming up, do I just not go near it until the absolute last minute? Do I tackle things head on? I tend to go at them and really try and be problem focused and problem solving oriented. Am I emotion focused? Do I get very caught up with how I feel about the event and actually not pay that much attention to the problem itself, but get quite focused on my feelings? Maybe in a helpful way in that I get support for them, or maybe in an unhelpful way in that I get really riled up about it. It's kind of making sense. Um, in managing CLL, some people will, will do what Michael and Dan are clearly doing. These guys are information seekers, yeah? 
You have a problem, you want to manage it, you go out there and you get information. And the more information you have, you probably feel more bolstered by it, right? So that's your main side. There's probably times it doesn't help. <laughs> because, sorry to be funny, by the way. <laughs> You're going to tell me it's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> but it's, ah, that's the thing, there isn't a right way. But we know, and I'm speaking to a biased audience, because if you come to a talk like this, you're probably an information seeker. Or the person who dragged you along is an information seeker. <laughs> you don't get to a talk like this unless you're quite problem focused and problem solving focused. And um, if you're an avoider, you wouldn't be here. Sometimes it's the doctor saying, Mm -hmm. Look at anything, you know? Yeah, absolutely. How are you supposed to learn about things? Well, I think what is helpful then to say back to that is that I find getting information really helps me manage. Can you advise me as where the most reputable sites are? You know? Well, I think the internet's a fantastic place if you know where to look. But if you get lost in tunnels of all kinds of personal stories that may or may not represent your experience of a disease, it can be very unhelpful. So that's my, I suppose that's how I manage that with my, my medical colleagues. This person finds that way of coping is really helpful for them. It's really important for them. It's how they are. So if, if you're worried about the stuff they're getting online, then show them a better way of doing it. Show them a place to go that will give them better information. But there's no point trying to take someone's coping away from them at a point of high anxiety because that's we need to do what we've already done. So just taking a second, just taking taking a couple of seconds and just closing your eyes. I do that easily because I, I work a lot with meditation, so I'm happy to close my eyes and for people. Um, and just thinking to yourself, and if you're the person in the room who has a diagnosis of CLL, if you're the person in the room who supports somebody with a diagnosis of CLL, how do you individually cope with this? What's your main style? And maybe there's lots of ways. What's your main style? And I suppose I'm interested then to know, is it different to how you would have coped with challenges before? Or does it really fit? Is it like, you know, maybe for John and Michael, they've always been people who are problem solving, information focused, you know? You, that's how they may have always approached things. That's, what I tend to do in a challenge. Um, so just knowing a little bit about your style is really helpful. Um, and then back to the idea, no one's strategy works for everyone all of the time. So once you've identified what your main style is, you might like to do this now, you might like to do this at home, you might like to do this at some point, weeks or months from now. When are the times when that style doesn't work for you? where information seeking and problem solving often comes up with a challenge is during periods of watchful waiting, where there is nothing, nothing that you're supposed to do. Um, and you're left kind of with that gap of, what, you know, do I just keep researching, which you can do, but maybe there needs to be a balance of how can I engage with the doing nothing? How can I engage with putting this a little bit to one side for now? Um, so every coping style will have its challenges. Um, and it's about kind of knowing your main style and then knowing what your challenges are. That makes sense. It can be a really difficult thing within partnerships, be it romantic or otherwise, where the person with the illness and the person who's their main support have different styles. You know, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but one person wants to read everything there is and the other person wants to just talk to what, hear what the doctor says. And it can create huge strain in relationships. Um, and that's why it was given out of time to go, this is my style. This works for me for these reasons. But yeah, the challenge then is it doesn't support my loved one or it doesn't help us easily fit together. So how are we as a, as a couple or as a partnership or as a family going to deal with that? Can we have a conversation about that? Can we put limits on how much you information seek and how much I avoid? Can we say that there's one day a week where we will talk about it? So being self-aware of our style and, and how that fits with our illness and how that fits with those who we support us with it, it's really helpful to reduce that overthinking mind and reduce that burden of stress. And um, yeah, we've got 
I talked about this. One of the things that, that us as psychologists um, have a bit of a challenge with, and especially in, in Vincent's, we've, we've tried to do have a bit of a campaign about this particular next issue of the last while, is this idea of smile or die. If you're not positive, it's not going to end well. <laughs> Flipping out. Um, it's really tough. It's really tough when you're dealing with illness to manage this message. It's tough if you are somebody who's naturally a very positive, optimistic person because some people can treat you like you're being completely in denial. It's tough if you're not somebody who's naturally like that and everybody thinks you should be or that's it, it's all going to go to rack and ruin and you'll be responsible for the whole thing. And I suppose what's been really unhelpful about that message is the idea that it's the only way to cope that's right. And I mean, the, you see it in the media, I just did a quick search today, and you've got stay positive <coughs> t-shirts, you've got sick ways for cancer patients to stay positive in the new year, you've got whether you think you can or you can't, you're right, so you're thinking creates everything. No bad thoughts, fight cancer. And this whole, there was a, a group of UK who just had a message board about this whole idea about does positive cancer help or hinder, or positive thinking help or hinder. I mean, I'm allergic to it. <laughs> and I'm a pretty positive person. <laughs> I'm allergic to it as a message. Because it's just so invalidating of all of the different ways there are to be. And actually, psychologically, if you're feeling vulnerable but you're pretending you feel positive, it's really damaging. So what we know helps, the tyranny of positivity as we call it, it's just this pressure to maintain a fighting stance because some people really want to language their engagement with cancer as a battle. They find that helpful, the language of fighting, the language of battling. Other people find that utterly unhelpful and neither is wrong. Um, but it really invalidates people's natural responses. Um, and a lady called Barbara Unrick wrote a book called Smile or Die, so that's where, where the language I've used has come from. Um, I suppose the message I have around that is just be who you are. And if thinking positively works for you, great. And if thinking positively works for you today but not tomorrow, great. But authenticity is, tends to be what's helpful from a psychological perspective. I'm authentic to how I feel right now. In so much as it's appropriate to the audience. Nobody probably really wants to know how you feel all of the time. But when you're with people, who you feel you want to be yourself, <coughs> that you can be authentic. Um, I get lots of requests, <coughs> and I work 50% with outpatients and 50% with, with inpatients in the hospital. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, when you're working with inpatients in an acute setting, they're there because something bad has happened or, or things have, something has cropped up. So there's an acute stress, it's an, it's an, an urgent or immediate situation. And often the, the, the team, when they send a referral, they go, look, will you just teach them a couple of things to manage? <laughs> and actually, it's, it's really appropriate that they want to help. But when something bad has happened, when we're in a crisis, it's not to know the time to learn new skills. Like, the day after you walked out of the doctor's office after getting a diagnosis of CLL, is not the time to sit down with a psychologist and go, so here's how I cope and now what am I going to need? When you're in the trenches, when you're in extreme stress, actually the best thing to do is what you've always done. And if you've always avoided, if you've always distracted, do that for now. And work on your coping, work on other ways of managing it over the next while. But in the middle of that kind of tornado, that's not the time to be trying on new ways of doing things. And we run mindfulness groups in the hospital, and they're brilliant, they really help, the evidence from them is fantastic. But it's not appropriate to do them today after you get a cancer diagnosis. Do you know, that's not the time to be doing that. You focus on what are the resources I have right now, how can I bolster them, how can I cope how I always coped, and then bring in stuff gradually over time. That kind of makes sense to people. We might not get to all four, but they will all be on the on the page app or on the presentation afterwards if you need them. I wasn't sure exactly what length I'd have to talk, so I aimed long and I can go too much slow. So this other this next point, the second of the four, is you remember to knowing what matters. Um, and I guess 
when you're given a diagnosis like CLL, I don't know if this happened for all of you, but maybe for some of you, it challenged your idea of who we are. So lots of us have a, a sense of ourselves of I'm somebody who's well, or I'm somebody who can do things physically. Um, and getting a diagnosis, whether or not you're feeling very ill at the time, can change that sense of ourselves. Um, it can change the sense of what our bodies can do. And it can change our relationships with others, because if we were somebody who feels that their role is always one of being the carer, or always one of taking responsibility or being a provider, when you get a diagnosis and all of a sudden our loved ones are trying to mind us, that can be a really uncomfortable place to be. Um, so knowing what matters, identifying your core values for yourself as a person can be a really helpful way of managing that. Um, and I suppose, how can it be a helpful way of managing it? Let me go to an example. Say, for example, the idea of, should I tell everybody at work? Did anyone have that question? That kind of, do I tell people I've seen if I'm not on treatment and I don't know what's happening? It's something that Jan brought up for me. How do you make that decision? There's no right or wrong decision, right? What would be, what might be some of the guidelines that might tell you whether it's the right decision for you? So if you sit down and think about what are my values in terms of my work self? Hands up anyone here who sees their work self as being, you know, well, I kind of value my privacy. I do a certain amount of sharing, but they don't know about my life. Does anyone value that in their work self? So value a sense of personal privacy? Yeah, a couple of nods. Anyone have much more of a, I am so in it, all of me, yeah, all of it, that's just how I am, and I, I'm collaborative to the end. So, if, and, and what I value in my collaborative approach is intimacy, I value intimacy in my work relationships. Well, if that's a value for you, if that's what feeds you in your work setting, then it's probably really important you find a way to talk to your colleagues about the diagnosis um, over time and in a way that works. But if you value privacy, then your idea of hell probably is for them to know that kind of information about you. The other kind of questions you might ask yourself is things like, you know, what are my values of work and sort of commitment or respect or competency if I'm going to be missing appointments and if I'm going to be out? If I really feel like diligence commitment are a huge part of what I value in my work self and I know I'm going to miss a certain amount of days, a certain amount of hours, how can I reconcile those two? And it might be that having someone on site who knows about the diagnosis and who can provide understanding that this isn't a lack of diligence, this isn't a lack of commitment, this is a change, change in set of circumstances, that might be really important. And outside of your manager who has to know that you're not here for medical reasons, Maybe a colleague. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, if you're in a shared office space and everybody sees if you're at your desk and all of a sudden you're not there but no one knows why and they think they're slacking or they might think of it. And if you don't, if valuing your, if yourself as a committed, reliable, diligent person and being seen like that isn't something you really value about yourself, then you won't care. You go, it doesn't matter what they think. But for some of us, being seen as diligent, being seen as committed, being seen as somebody who's reliable and shows up is a huge part of what we bring to our work self. So the perception that other people will have of our absences will have a really big impact on us. And in that instance, those core people who see us every day knowing might take a huge burden off us when we walk in after the last time. That makes sense. So it's, it's not a kind of it's not the most clear-cut advice. It's about saying, in my various roles, what do I value? Uh, what do I value about what I bring to that role and how I'm seen in that role? And then, how does this illness challenge that? And how can I live it? So, in my relationship with my loved one, if I value communication, but actually I'm someone who shuts down when I'm in a state of stress, how can I work on that? because that's something that's really important to me. Communication and intimacy is really important to me in my relationship, but I know I'm not going to talk about this because I get really wound up and I try and avoid it. So there's a conflict there between something that's really important to me and something that's changed in our lives because of CLL. So it's just about finding a way of bridging it, finding a way 
to get as close to our values as we can by living with illness. Yeah, I think I've kind of talked through that one. We had a, a conference on at work the other day and we had a speaker from the UK, um, really fabulous, um, Diana. I can't think of her surname right now, which is very helpful. But um, she works in the Centre for Appearance Research and she does a lot of research around decision making in oncology. Um, and she's come up with this decision making tool that they're piloting in, in some of the hospitals over there. It's specifically designed for people who are going for surgery. Um, but it can be used really for any kind of healthcare related decision making. And I'm just going to pop it up here so they have it. Um, but the kind of questions that they, they ask people in this decision making aid is to have a conversation with somebody where you go through what are your main worries, but you also identify what's important to you. Um, so a lot of people that I would meet who are making treatment related decisions, they might be at a point with CLL where the burden of their symptoms is getting higher. And the decision is, do I start treatment or do I wait a little longer? The fatigue is getting worse or infections are getting worse. And for some people, they don't have a role in that decision. That's the medical team will make that decision and, and pass it down. And then other, for other people, it's more of a collaborative process. How long do you feel you can keep going at the moment with, with your symptom burden as it is? And when it's a collaborative process, I suppose for patients, it's really helpful, it's helpful if they're able to identify what are my main concerns? What is important to me? Because if fatigue is my main symptom and spending time with my children is my main priority, then maybe the treatment's worth it. <coughs> because I really want to be able to spend time with my children with a bit more energy. Or is the treatment going to address that symptom? Exploring a bit how is that important? So once you've decided what, then how? Um, and then I suppose as psychologists, what we also do is then dig down, because often the first time thing we think of isn't the most important at all. The first thing we think of might end up being quite secondary. So thinking of what is important. So for people having surgery, and this is women with, with breast cancer, they might talk about something like, well, appearance is important, but actually reducing cancer risk is the most important thing. When I think of people um, living with CLL, I think a bit about, okay, my, my quality of life is, is massively important, but actually my most important thing is longevity. And is this treatment likely to give me the most amount of time before I relapse, or even what's the long-term picture looking like? So it's just about identifying what's important to you, and then trying to kind of say, okay, well, what if we have to choose, which very often in medical decision making we do, what would you prioritize for right now? And I suppose what it helps is it helps make the decision about your lived experience. Because our medical colleagues can, can make really great decisions based on the data. They can make really great decisions based on our blood results. And based on what we tell them. But what they can't do is know what matters to you unless you know and you can tell them. Um, so it's really, really helpful and important, I think, when, when looking at treatment options and when looking at medical decision making, to be able to identify what matters, what are our values and what matters. So these are just some of the questions that can be helpful when you're going through that kind of a process. <coughs> That's going to need a few more minutes, so what we're going to do is we're going to skip resilience. Um, but it'll all be there, you can have a look. Um, I'm going to just tell you this story instead, because it, uh, it, it sums up resilience pretty easily. Does anyone know the Aesop's fable about the oak and the reeds? It's a, a Aesop's fables were all pretty old, so it's a very old story about this oak tree that grows up next to a riverbank beside a load of reeds. And as oak trees are, um, really has quite a sense of its own importance. Um, and it grows up to be all majestic and fabulous, and generally degrading the reeds and going, listen, you're not up to much, and years pass, and you haven't really grown, and look what's come of me, and I'm getting more fabulous by the day. Um, and everybody stops to look at the oak tree, and everybody thinks the oak tree is fabulous. No one really pays any attention to the reeds. And as the story goes, one winter there was a terrible storm, um, Hurricane Ophelia-esque, and the, the oak tree gets uprooted. But the reeds, you see, they have this magic power. They know how to be flexible. They know how to move. So they're all grand. Um, and I suppose not to too fine a point if they have the last laugh. But it's, it's really, it's, it's a lovely story that actually Harry Barry uses to, to talk about what resilience is. Resilience is not being any one way. Psychological resilience, if it's anything, is about being flexible. And when 
we find that the way that we have of coping isn't working great for us, how can I shift it? And I suppose with that in mind, it might be helpful to end with a little bit of information about what supports are actually available. Do you guys, did you get told about psychological support or what's available or what's around? Helpful, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> here's this really big really diagnosis. Go for it. Look, we're getting better at it, but it's slow, so you'll have to bear with us. It's very variable across the country. Um, and I suppose it's something that the, the, late, the National Cancer Strategy last year really worked to do. So last year was the first time that psycho-oncology and the psychological needs of patients with diagnosis was put in as a whole section of itself. And one of the recommendations of that strategy is that there would be a national lead for psycho-oncology, so a person identified who could help lead the development of services around the country based on a proposal that a bunch of us working in the area submitted that, that got inserted more or less fully into the, into the, the strategy. Putting a national lead in place is happening at the moment. It's a really good step. But I guess unless the money comes to actually fund posts, then it's really only a tokenistic thing. It'll tell you what you need, but not how to go about getting it. At the moment, there are psycho-oncology services in Beaumont Hospital, in, the, in Vincent's and in James's. So even in Dublin, which apparently had everything, um, there's one of the main hospitals, such as the Matter, which doesn't have psycho-oncology service. So that tells you where we're at. Um, and I mean, we have two psychologists for, I don't even know how many thousands of patients go through Vincent's every year. There are psycho-oncology services in Letterkenny. There are psycho-oncology services now in Limerick and Cork, limited, and in Limerick, I think, in Cork, as I understand it, they have psychiatry but not psychology. So psychiatry will do medication support and management but not necessarily talk therapy, which people want. Um, it's growing. I mean, that is a hell of a lot more people than I would have been able to tell you a few years ago. We rely a huge amount on the community support services, the cancer support centres providing <coughs> counselling and, and interventions to support for, for patients that we just can't see that number of. If anyone has any questions about how to access psychology privately, or what are the ways of going through that to know that somebody's qualified to a level and have experience, I have my email with Jan and, and do contact me. Um, I guess what we know from a psychological perspective is that if something lasts for a day, you know, we, we, we live in age, we, we, we wait. If, if something starts getting in the way of how we function, if how you feel starts getting in the way of your basic functioning, so the relationships you're having with people, your capacity to do your day-to-day -day activities, your, your eating, your sleeping, your, your sense of enjoyment. You know, we're, all of us in the room, for better or worse, there is more right with us than wrong with us, or we wouldn't be here. Um, and that, that can be hard to remember sometimes when there are so many challenges. Um, but yeah, the mindfulness teacher I once worked with said, so long as we're breathing, there is more right with us than not wrong with us. You know, I guess on paper it's true. But if it doesn't feel like that, if it feels that there's more wrong with us than right with us, and we can't actually engage with life, then I would really advocate getting a bit of support and starting with friends and family and then broadening that circle out to professionals like me if things aren't improving. And the rule of thumb, you know, if you've had two weeks and you're feeling the same level of awful for two weeks and it's really affecting your functioning, then Maybe it's time to talk to your GP, maybe it's time to talk to somebody about where you can get a bit of extra support. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get to get to the end of my four, but I will pass it on to Jan. And thank you so much for your time and attention.